you very much. Well, good evening, everybody, and well done to turn out on a night like this. We're going to look this evening at just a few verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We've been digging into this book over a number of weeks now, and here we are in chapter 5, and we are coming to verses 12 to 15. That little paragraph, 1 Thessalonians 5. I can tell you the number it is in my Bible, but it won't be the same as I expect, and you won't want it anyhow. Now, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn them who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everybody else. Well, we're all in this together then, aren't we? Let's pray and ask for help as the Lord speaks. Lord, speak in the silence here tonight as we read your word. Help us to understand what it is you're saying to us personally. Give to us the willingness and the ability to respond so that we may continue to be useful to you in your service. And when that moment comes that you, Lord Jesus, return to this world, whether that finds us awake or asleep, alive or in your presence already, we may be ready to meet you and to hear your voice say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. I wonder, how do you finish a letter that you've written to someone? Well, it depends, doesn't it? You can't give an easy, straight answer to that. It depends, first of all, on who you're writing to. If it's someone you know and love, the chances are there will be a fulsome sort of last paragraph about how much you love them. If it's uh, somebody else, it may be quite a, a different way of finishing a letter. And then it uh, depends on what you've been writing about. If you're complaining about the noise that they're making next door or something, you'll probably be pretty curt and uh, terse with them at the end of the letter. Who you're writing to, what you're writing about, and perhaps a little more facetiously, it can depend on how much room you've got at the end of the page. If you finish up your letter and you've got just two lines, I'm sure you know the feeling, we've all done it, well, all I can squeeze in here is lots of love from, or see you soon, or something like that. You've just turned over the page, and oh, there's all this space. What on earth am I going to say now? It'll look stupid if I just finish right up there. Well, I don't know whether Paul was concerned about that. He was writing a letter here, and uh, we've done this already. But uh, let's think very briefly of this letter as a letter. And Paul starts off on page one. We won't call it chapter one. And on page two, he says, Hello, folks. Oh, I am grateful to you for the welcome you gave me when I came to see you. And even more, the way you accepted the message I had for you. 
Do you remember how the faith and the love and the hope came out? Three things. And we're going to notice all sorts of three things, I think, tonight. So that was page one, but now he turns over. New sheet of, what was it they wrote on? Papyrus or something, was it? You know, I don't suppose it was uh, Basil and Bond in those days, but anyhow, he's on page two now, and he's got something else to say to them. Well, he said, yes, I did enjoy it, but I didn't come to you to upset you or to be a burden to you, like a, a little baby, a child is a burden for a while on its parents. I came rather to be like a mother to you and to nurse you or like a father to guide you. And that's the way it was. And thank God for that. But he's getting towards the bottom of the page and he says, but I am missing you. Oh, I had to run away. You remember, I got chased out of your place and had to go on to, oh, where was it? Athens, uh, Corinth, different towns. And he was persecuted. But I miss you. I miss you and the more I miss you, the more I try to get back to you. But it wasn't to be. I just couldn't make it. So in the end, I sent my young friend Timothy. I thought he'd find out how you were and tell me how you were getting on. And he has, and he's come back. And he's brought me a glowing picture of your faith and love and hope. There they are again. So that's page two done, isn't it? But now he's got to go on to uh, page three. And this time he is going to talk about, anyhow at the end of it, what God wants from those friends of his in Thessalonica. Guess how many things there were? Three. Of course. Let me read them to you. They come at the end of page three in this letter and verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. Prayer number one. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Number three, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. And that really is perhaps the sort of climax of his letter to them. This is what he's praying for them more and more. But I can't help feeling that young Timothy, who's been and uh, had a little while with them, says, Paul, you know, that Thessalonica is a moral cesspit. It's a dreadful place. How on earth those Christians will keep what you've told them about God's will for them, I don't know. As it is, they're bothered about the Lord Jesus coming back, what it's going to be like, who's going to die first, who's going to be ready and who's not. And well, we don't read that, I'm only imagining it. But we do know that Paul seems to break off at that point and in beginning of page four of his letter, he says, finally, brothers, oh, yes, we'd better come to this before we close, hadn't we? And he deals with those subjects. They're not our subjects tonight. We're just sort of getting a bit closer. And he speaks to them of the details of the Lord's return and says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. I can understand how upset you have been, but derive comfort from this knowledge that I'm giving you. And then, well, you're waiting for him, and in page five he starts about how they should wait for the Lord to come. And he's got, I suppose, about halfway down page five, which is where we start tonight, because there's a bit left 
And what is it he's going to say? You'll notice that page 5, chapter 5, starts with the word, Now, brothers. And where we start in verse 12, Now we ask you, brothers. I want to suggest to you that he's thinking of the relationships that the folk in Thessalonica have this way, that way, and that way as they wait for the Lord to come. And the first relationship that he picks on here is to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and to admonish you, which is, well, this has been a really thorny subject. A number of the Bible students have said, well, this is obviously the elders in the church. But others say, perhaps not. This was a very young church, and it may be that uh, elders hadn't been appointed. And then others say, well, don't forget, there was a synagogue there anyhow, and there'd be a ruler of the synagogue and they'd be used to that. Well, I don't think it really matters whether these people had actually been appointed, elected, chosen. They were the leaders in this church. Now, I certainly didn't ask to be given this subject, but I can understand that none of the elders would want to tackle it because it's a bit invidious, isn't it, to say, go, oh, look at me here, great chap. No. That's the very opposite. But my wife and I would like to say that from the moment we came here last year, we couldn't help noticing how so many people were hard at work. We looked at the leaflet on Sunday morning. Look, there's this on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Who does all this? They've got some hard workers here. So can we say... Thank you to God for all those who are leading any part of the work tonight and throughout the week, day after day. This was the first thing that Paul wanted to add to his friends over there, to respect them who work hard among you. He's going to have something in a minute to say about those who are idle. Not necessarily leaders, but it would include them, I suppose. But these work hard in the Lord. They are over you. Oh, please don't get the impression that elders are somewhat up here. Deacons are there, and we're down here. This was written and addressed to the congregation, to brothers and sisters. It's not that at all. We remember the words of the Lord Jesus to his disciples when he said, rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over you. They're up there on their throne. And then very simply in four words, not so with you. If you want to be great, You've got to be the servant of all. This is the mandate for Christian leadership. But at the same time, we, as the congregation in the church, are to respect those who work so hard and are over you in that sense. We're not under the law I suppose we're under grace, if anything, and in that sense we could say, the yes, the leaders of the church are over us and we are to hold them in the highest regard. That's a, well, it's described as a, a triple superlative. If I said something was the best, that is superlative. If I say it's the best of the best, well, that's pretty rare, but it's a higher level. If I say the best of the best of the best, that's what we've got here. The Lord's opinion and appreciation 
of those who work hard in his service. So may I say to everyone tonight, your service is appreciated up there. What an encouragement to go on and to go on serving the Lord. And this was the first of the things that Paul wanted to add to all he had said. Will it surprise you to find that in the verses from here to the end of the chapter there are, I think, 15 instructions? Yes, and they break down into five groups of three. We're not going to look at them all tonight, don't worry. Is there anything in this numbers business that the number three means something special? There are some numbers, I'm sure, in the Bible. For example, the number seven that does speak of completion and completeness and perfection. How about the number three? Would you like to do a little Bible search and look up in the Old Testament, the book of Ecclesiastes and chapter four? This book, do we? Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Where shall we start reading? Let's start reading at verse 6, shall we? No, it's not. It's verse 8. Sorry. It's only a tiny little print. Or make it verse 9. That's better still. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one man may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Now this... A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Well, in this letter to the Thessalonians, I think we have a number of pigtails, strands, three strands woven together. You know how it is? Maybe if you've had daughters and you've tried to pull their hair, you've got told off, but you haven't got very far because you can't pull out anybody's hair if it's woven together in a pigtail. And that's what we've got here. Let's try another illustration. Have you ever been to a farm, some time ago no doubt, and watched them milking the cows, hand milking, not machine milking? What is it that the milkmaid is sitting on? It's a three-legged stool, isn't it? And why a three-legged stool? Because you can't knock a three-legged stool over if the cow kicks you. A three-legged stool, table, whatever it is, will sit firm on any floor. I think there is a lesson here. If something is repeated three times, put perhaps from three different angles, it is firm. It is something that is important, something that will last, something for us at least to notice. So if we find all these threes coming up, well, at least saying... This is God repeating and repeating and repeating again, and it's for us to take in. Where were we? Oh, yes. That's right. The elders. I think we've perhaps mentioned that is one of the relationships which is important in the life of a Christian church member who is waiting for the Lord to come. If the Lord comes back tonight and I am slating the elders, that's not what he wants from me. Can I just say that when a congregation is backing up their elders, what a difference it makes to the way the elders can do their job, to the length of elders' meetings for one thing, when we're not thinking, oh dear, there's Mrs. So-and-so, she won't like it if we have this hymn on Sunday morning and there's somebody else niggling over there. Let's support them. It doesn't mean we'll always agree with them. They won't always agree with us, no doubt. But let's hold them in great respect.
because this is what God wants. Oh, I've spent much too much time on them, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the next instruction is this. Live in peace with each other. Well, if we're that sort of people, we're not going to go around niggling with other members in the congregation, are we? Maybe. But I wonder, is that what it means here? Live in peace. What does it mean to live in peace? Remember, the context here is waiting for... We should be living in peace with each other. But if I am to live in peace, what does that mean for me? That was verse 13. Now come back, if you will, in 1 Thessalonians 5 to verse 3. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. It's one thing to say peace. It's another thing to live in peace. Verse 3. Verse 13. Verse 23. What does verse 23 have to say to us? <clears throat> May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blame the coming of our Lord Jesus. Here it is again, the great event for which we're all looking, the coming of our Lord Jesus. And if our spirit and our soul and our body are to be kept blameless, we are to live in peace. He is our peace. And it's tantamount to saying, live in him. And how much is... Time to look at all the verses tonight about the God of peace. as one who brought again from the dead... Our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, sanctify you wholly. Sanctify, that's his object for us when he comes again. We've got elders and leaders to respect. We've got a great good shepherd to lead us on. And we are, may I suggest it, to live in him, yes, with each other. There should be, there surely must be. And if we trust him, there is a special relationship between me and him, between you and him. And together we are living in peace. It's his very nature, his very character, and he shares it with us. So we were thinking about relationship with elders and this time with God himself. But in the next verse, very briefly, we have relationships with other people. For example, the idle, the timid, or oh, that can include depressed in the word that's used there. Not just like a little mouse-like person, but someone who's really going through it. Someone who's feeling very low. Somebody who just can't see another day ahead. And we are to have a relationship with people like this. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Paul, you've got a bit of paper left at the end of your letter. Oh, says Paul, I'm going to put this in. This is important. My relationship with my fellow Christians. If I were to ask, certainly not going to, put your hand up if you've never been 
idle, if you've never been timid, never these things, I don't think we'd get any hands going up at all, not truthfully anyhow, because we all know this, and we all know what it is when someone comes alongside us and helps us. And this, and this is what God intends we should be. Just putting ourselves in the place of the other person and helping them to see God's will. The idol, that was a word taken from the Roman army of a soldier who broke rank, went off on his own. Well, unfortunately, there are people that we need to sort of go after and welcome back and love back. They're the idle ones. The weak I've spoken about. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. That's a bit more difficult, isn't it? Very briefly, I remember at boys' camp just after the war, I was put with a senior officer, I was only very young and inexperienced, to collect brushwood from the beach for the church bonfire. And there was uh, one lad in the group, a big lad from Manchester, and he said, oh, I'm not going to collect brushwood, anybody can do that. Oh, I'm going to collect timber. Well, there was enough timber and what was needed, and you know that if you're going to have a good bonfire, you've got to have a lot of brushwood. Anyhow, this lad slapped my friend across his face. Wham! My friend, the senior of the officers there, happened to be a blacksmith. And the strength in his arms was quite proverbial. And he stood there and I thought, wow, this lad is going to go flying across those sand dunes when he gets a whack from this chap. But my friend, his name was Cecil. He turned and looked him in the face and said, if you want to hit one cheek, there's the other. I don't know what effect it had on that lad. He just grumbled and mumbled and went away. But I tell you what effect it's had on me. I've seen the Lord in action. And that is part of our duty. So there it is. And there is so much more in these instructions but we haven't time to go on tonight. We've seen something of the relationships that Paul was urging on his friends in Thessalonica, beginning with the elders and deacons and music and flowers and everything else that had to be looked after. Then he went on to talk about the relationship with God, who is our peace. And then with relations with other people. May God help us as we seek to fit in to the relationship that God has chosen for us and make it our life's work for him in his name. Amen. Now we're going to sing our closing hymn. In the book it's number 200. <clears throat>